was a nightmare that one would never want to waken from because it was also the best of dreams. It wasn't anything on that scale. I mean, that kind of, you know, you just walked in and it was a different world. The best place to start is the fact that it was owned and run by probably the very first dance band ever, which, which was New Order. I mean, and, and dance band is a loose word to use, but the very first electronic band, the fact that New Order opens up a nightclub in the middle of Manchester for them and their mates to go to or, or sort of places where their type of music could be played, I think was a, was a massive sort of reason why it was successful. Late 1980, we've gone to New York and um, we've been exposed to these very glossy, groovy, alternative, post-Studio 54 American discos. And we liked them. So we got back to Manchester and we thought, oh, we'll have one of them. The first thing I did was uh, take, we took the microphone out of the DJ box. Because DJs, you know, in those days used to talk inane drivel between each song. <laughs> And, you know, we didn't want any of that. We'd been to, to kind of New York and seen DJ's mix. Someone came in and said, um, who are you building this for? And we went, um, the kids. And they went, when did you last see the kids? Why have you built them a New York-style disco? To which we had absolutely no answer. The real answer was we built it for ourselves, all seven of us, but there you go. The design of the Hacienda, um, the, the interior design was probably the first time that anything like that had been done in the UK. I mean, um, for a club that opened in the early 80s, it looked like it, it could have existed in the early, early 90s. And I st still think to this day that not, nothing was sort of designed for dancing like that was. I think simplicity was the key, was, was the name of the game. We'd just been to clubs around London and stuff. There wasn't anything on that scale. You know, that sort of attention to the, to the sound and just all the way it was put together and stuff. It, it was just a, a dream opportunity to have this kind of vast space with these wacky clients. Um, and nobody really knew what it was that they wanted. But when it came to the look of the place, because there were columns in the centre of the space which were hazardous, an obvious thing to me seemed to be to, to mark them with stripes which you, you would find in, in a factory environment where you have industrial machinery that hazards are marked with certain coded colours. They've just totally nailed it. The design of the place was just amazing. I mean, you know, I think it's been much copied in various other clubs around Britain and around the world. It just turned into this kind of monster orgy of self-expression. For the first five years, we were probably the only ones who went. The great cultural change comes with the Ibiza experience, working-class northern kids, spring, summer, 88. That culture and that culture collided, and the fact that it collided on the dance floor of the Hacienda, uh, it's just fucking wonderful. <laughs> was from 88 to 1992 um, the best nightclub in the world. There's something special about that place. It had this kind of, uh, I don't know how to describe it, this kind of electrical energy in the air. And you knew when you walked into that place, even when there were only sort of two, three hundred people in there, you just, you could feel that it was, it was going to be a, a crazy evening. There's lots of different music being played that's what we used to like about it. You know, there'd be sort of hip hop, weird, kind of atmospheric records at the beginning that Mike Pickering used to play, but then, you know, big vocal house and sort of pretty tough techno and stuff, but all, it, all put together really well, and that's what excited us. Mm. 
Well, there was like the whole scally element of it, you know. We were, they were called Perry Boys in those days, but um, we were we were kind of those people ourselves, so we wanted them in our club. Apparently, we put Stella quid a pint on Fridays in 1987, which some people believe is central cultural moment because Stella was the chosen drink of Scallies. The Scallies were kind of going to Ibiza and beginning to do E, and the Scallies were therefore coming for Stella, quid a pint, and being exposed to house music. I think I was like 19 at the time, we'd all been waiting for something pretty cool to happen, and bang! This club 30 miles up the road from where I lived opens up and, you know, had my picking and playing the very first house music. Oh, it definitely changed Britain in the nightlife. So it's changed, to be honest, if we were really big headed about it, it's changed the rest of the world in the nightlife sense. As you go in, there'd be the, the dance floor just seething and there'd be acid corner seething and walk through that middle. It was always an utterly remarkable experience. Huh? That is our idea of a good club, you know, that, that informs everything we've done, whether it be DJing or, or the places we play, that's like the vision of the Hacienda and people being really excited about music. The beginning of the end of for the Hacienda was probably around about 91, 92, where it became a victim of its own success. Yeah, a lot of people suddenly started to open other clubs. I think people suddenly realised how much money was involved in clubbing, whatever the drug situation was, different gangs wanted to control it. And it just, you know, you started going there and seeing nasty things, people getting beaten up or little drug scuffles going on, and it's just the, it, the vibe had gone. We went to the police in 1989 to say, hey guys, there's a problem coming. Um, guns are becoming fashionable, and if we don't get hold of this, guys, we're in real trouble. We stopped going when it became a bit hairy, you know, a bit violent. Um, like a lot of people did, you know, it got a bit scary. We work in America a lot. There are policemen on the door. Don't, can't do that. But we'll pay you. Can't do that. But you do it at football matches. Ah, oh, yes, but that's different. How is it different? Uh, it's just different. And that was the constant conversation. And then on the 11th birthday party, Dave Morales was playing downstairs. He's quite a good friend of mine, and I was playing upstairs. And almost simultaneously, we both got threatened <laughs> by this scummy little gang. And uh, I just thought, oh, I'm out of here now, that's it. The Hacienda is closing its doors as of today. It is with the greatest reluctance that for the moment we're turning the lights out on what is, for us, a most important place. We watched the downfall of the Hacienda in so many ways where the Hacienda left off, I think we picked up the baton. If Cream could be remembered for half the things that the Hacienda and Factory did in 10 years' time, I, I, I'd be a very, very happy person. If I was Tony Wilson, I'd have no regrets whatsoever. I think they did something pretty, pretty amazing. We're, the, we're always the proof, Factory and Hacienda, that being early doesn't make you money, but it's nice to be early, it's nice to be first. I think we're all extremely glad and honoured to have been part of whatever this thing was. Um, it's bloody great, yeah, so the hell with Cream and Ministry and the rest of it and Iron Apper and, uh, and Ibiza. Fuck them all. Next up, more Garage Tunes in flavour. There was a time I called before 